Good evening. Thanks so much for all of you coming out after Labor Day. We have a couple of announcements to make before we introduce the speaker for the evening. Tonight we feature the eccentric life and times of Edward Gorey. Now, on to tonight and tonight's speaker. First of all, a big thank you to our sponsors, Peter and Sue Elephthorakis. I hope I said that right. Where are they? Way in the back. Thank you, Peter and Sue. Edward Gorey. How many are familiar with that name? OK. He is typically described as an illustrator, and his books can be found in the humor and the cartoon section of bookstores. Gorey classified his own work as literary nonsense. It's a genre made most famous by Lewis Carroll and Edward Lear. In Gorey's later years, he lived and worked in Yarmouthport and directed numerous evening events, entertainments, often featuring his own paper mache puppets. He has, had a, he has long had a cult following. But I will let our speaker, Ken Morton, tell you all about it. Ken Morton, he will fill in the rest. Ken Morton is a graduate of Vassar College, and he is the director of the Edward Gorey House Museum. And he's a first cousin, once removed, of Edward Gorey himself. He is the son of one of the so-called deranged cousins of Edward Gorey. Please welcome Ken Morton. Thank you. Um, how's the volume? OK, let's get started. Um, first, the title of the presentation. Uh, a, a sort of an ongoing joke when Edward was alive is that uh, many people thought he was both English and already dead. And uh, the, uh, title, the title that I'm using here is also the title of a forthcoming biography, which I'll uh, talk about a little bit later. Um, the reason this is an idiosyncratic overview is because Edward who I'm going to start calling Ted, um, uh, was very prolific uh, in multiple art, uh, forms of, me uh, you know, he, he illustrated, he painted, he was involved in the theater. Um, he had a very interesting life, and uh, so this is kind of my uh, slice of Edward Gorey's life. Um, we called him Ted in the family, um, and it rolled my tongue easier, so I'm just going to refer to him as Ted. Um, that does make this, though, my first Ted talk. Thank you, Eric. Um, this, uh, all the photos in this presentation were taken by my aunt, Eleanor Garvey, who is the, uh, the second of the three deranged cousins. Um, this particular photo was taken in the early 60s, and I th we think it was, uh, that's Barnstable Harbor in the background, and that it, might, it was taken somewhere behind the Bacon Farm Inn. Um, but we're not, well, anyway, that's definitely Barnstable Harbor in the background. And uh, let's move on. Um, so, all my life, I, I've run into people who've either never heard of Edward Gorey or who were over-the-top fans. Um, but for the people who've never heard of Edward Gorey, uh, quickly, he got his, his career start doing book cover illustrations for other writers. He worked uh, as an illustrator for Doubleday uh, when he uh, graduated from college. Um, his big claim to fame when he really made it uh, was the Edward Gorey production of Dracula uh, that ran on Broadway uh, in the mid-70s. Um, he was nominated for two Tony Awards, one for the costumes and one for the set designs. Um, he ended up winning for the costumes, which he never thought made much sense. Um, and uh, he thought he should have gotten it for the sets. Um, that's, I know it's small, um, but that's, uh, that's the Edward Gorey set on the bottom right and a poster uh, that added. And uh, the, the success of that led him to an opportunity to do the animation for the introduction of Mystery on PBS. Um, which many people have seen, even if they don't know it was Edward Gorey. Um, and you can, uh, you can watch the, the videos available online. Um, let's see, and that's that. Um, he published over 100 works while he was alive, and they're compiled, compiled into these four amphigories. 
um, which I brought with me, and uh, if anybody wants to browse through them afterwards, uh, I, I have them. Um, one a little cute thing here is here um, are little uh, calling cards that the cat is dropping, and there are 15 cards, and it corresponds to the 15 books uh, that are in that uh, compilation, um, and that follows on the other ones too. Um, these are little details that I'll point out as we go. Um, so that's a great way to see pretty much everything that he both wrote and illustrated. Um, throughout his career, he also did illustrations for other authors, um, which are not included in these uh, anthologies. Why am I giving this talk? Um, my one actual uncle uh, lives in South Carolina, and I didn't get, actually see very much, um, but we, uh, we spent... My, my family spent summers in the uh, summer home that I still live in, in uh, on Millway and Barnstable. And it was my grandparents, my parents, my aunt Eleanor, and Ted Gorey. And uh, from a, subjectively, he was more like an uncle than a first cousin once removed. And many people just always assumed he was my uncle and still refer to him as Uncle Ted. Um, so I'm actually his first cousin once removed. And my mother, who's here today, is uh, one of his two first cousins. Um, that's me as a baby. Everybody likes baby pictures, except for me. Um, uh, that's uh, Ted, my mother, myself, and my grandmother, Betty Garvey, uh, sitting at the end of the boardwalk at uh, Gray's Beach in 1978. And that's uh, me, my mother, and Ted on the, uh, the, uh, the west bar, the big bar, the great bar, the back bar, the, the big sand bar at the end of Sandy Neck that people have their own names for. And my mother actually painted a watercolor that, that photo. Um, along with all the art that he created, he had his uh, various passions. Um, probably the biggest in his life was ballet. Oh, next to nothing about ballet. Um, but that's a poster that was also made into a towel of the five uh, basic ballet positions. Um, Notice, if you notice the way the feet are positioned, uh, cause that's, I'm going to point something out about that later on. Um, he, was a, he was probably the most well-read and literate person I've ever known. Uh, he had over 25,000 books in his, in his house when he passed away. Um, he was an avid reader and could speak on just about any topic. Um, he had a... Uh, he had sort of a dual life. Uh, the first one was in New York, and I don't know that much about it, um, except how he looked, um, which is that he, uh, he was often seen in sneakers, jeans, um, luxurious fur coats, uh, and, and jewelry, back before men generally wore jewelry. Um, and admission, it was a bit of a put-on. It was a, sort of a public persona. Um, but he could be seen at every uh, production of, the, of George Balanchine, New York City Ballet for decades, and he would show up in his costume and became quite a fixture. Um, I just realized the one thing about Pat, um, it, it, but he was also big and big on cats, liked them more than people. He said more than once. Turned get up when he was on the Cape, which was uh, flip flops, uh, shorts. Um, we'll see some pictures of that, uh, like life with the family on the Cape later on. Um, I'm going to explain the picture on the right. Uh, we, he had an enormous collection of jigsaw puzzles, and we'd, he'd often work on them alone, or we'd work on them uh, as a family. Um, the one he's pointing at, though, is called The Three Bears at Night, and it's just a solid brown jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> and uh, it, it took him a long time to do, and you can tell he's pretty happy that he finished it. <laughs> Um, the TV shows and movies, he, he, he gobbled up TV and went to every movie that was playing back when you had to go to the theaters. And uh, he, I, he always had very strong, quick opinions about, about his movies, or about movies he saw. Um, most, of, most usually they were negative. It was the, wor the worst movie he'd ever seen was almost every movie. Um, and I tried to figure out what it was that, like, every now and then he'd like something that I thought wasn't very good. Um, but I think I figured, I figured it out, kind of, that what he didn't like was pretense. If, if somebody was too self-serious, unwilling to laugh at themselves, 
And the kinds of TV shows that he really liked were things like The Golden Girls and uh, the original Star Trek, um, Doctor Who, um, you know, things that some people might think are kind of trashy, but they, were, they, they weren't aiming higher than they, they hit. Um, the uh, rice-stuffed animals, when he seemed to always need to do something with his hands, so if he wasn't actually drawing, he was making these little stuffed animals. So I brought three examples, um, which you can look at more closely later. It's an elephant, a rabbit, and a frog. And there are, he, he made the patterns on, a, on the uh, paper from an old grocery bag, um, and then uh, made the frogs or the, the animals, and he stuffed them all with Uncle Ben's rice through a little hole, and then, and then stitched it up. And he made hundreds of them. Um, many of them got lost to uh, mice. Um, oh, not surprisingly. Um, and then, uh, in addition to all his drawing and painting, uh, later in life he took a, an etching course at the community college. Um, and uh, the t-shirt I'm wearing is actually from uh, one of his etchings. It's also on the tote bag there. Um, and uh, prints of his etchings are available at the Edward Gorey House, which I'll talk about more later, too. Um, so, of his own works, uh, probably the most famous one is the Gashley Chrome Tinies. Um, I saw somebody bringing a copy in with them today. Um, it's an alphabet of 26 children who all end up dead. Uh, and so, the, I, just to, to give you an idea of it, A is for Amy who fell down the stairs, B is for Basil assaulted by bears, and it continues through the alphabet. Um, that's the front cover there, which is uh, what Shaban Magnus uh, has tattooed on her arm, uh, the, the American Idol semi-finalist a few years ago. Um, so the front cover has the 26 tinies, and the back cover has the 26 graves. <laughs> and this I included partly because people who know me know I spend a lot of time on a bike. And uh, this is a collect, he did a collection of, a series of postcards, which were compiled into a book called The Broken Spoke. And uh, this is, well, so we just saw the Gashley Crumb Tinies, which, though kind of funny, is also kind of not funny. And, but this is just straight up his attempts at, at humor. And I, this one on the left is a personal favorite. Uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the name, but, and his famous unreflecting bicycle. Um, the one on the top right, uh, I don't know if you can all read it, so I'll read the things. Um, it says, Innocence on the bicycle of propriety, carrying the urn of reputation safely over the abyss of indiscretion. <laughs> and uh, the one on the bottom right, um, it, I couldn't figure out which way to orient it, because it's the text, it, the, the te well anyway, I thought the text should be readable. Um, it says, Arthur Iggleby, the long distance champion, working out on nattering sands. And I included that one because it's uh, one of the few sort of Cape Coddy things. Because um, there, there he is riding a bike on a sandbar, which is something that I do. Um, nattering sands is not a real place, though. The Unstrung Harp was his first published book. Um, it's the front and the back cover. The, uh, the text in the bottom of the back cover says, Mr. Gorey, Mr. Earbrass, and a knowledgeable friend. Um, so that's a self-portrait of, of Ted in the fur coat and the sneakers. Um, I'm partly mentioning this uh, to, so that you, the, if you, you note the type of, the, the way he portrays the people here, um, which I refer to as Mr. Earbrass era, or just, the, well, that's Mr. Earbrass. Um, and that's a sample page. This is, th that illustration on the right is one of the only illustrations in his entire oeuvre um, that has something sort of from reality, namely the Boston Red Sox sweater. Um, and the text uh, at the bottom there says, for writing, Mr. Earbrass affects an athletic sweater of forgotten origin and unknown significance. It is always worn hindside too. Um, so, 
the Red Sox. He went to school in, at Harvard, um, so he, I mean, he actually does know the origin and significance of, of the beat. <laughs> um, so note the figure, um, and this is, uh, this is a bit of an experiment I'm gonna try now. This is um, an, a, an Edward Gorey triptych, uh, or in this case, it's three pairs, or anyway. Um, this is a set of illustrations that he gave to my, uh, my Aunt Isabel and have, have come down to me through the family. Um, this is the Mr. Earbrass character. Um, these are all paired the way he paired them. In fact, I, this is the actual drawings. And, that, and, the, and that's, these are way blown up, um, which gives you an idea of how fine his cross-hatching work was, that even blown up, uh, the detail is pretty spectacular. Um, but I'm going to point out some things about these six illustrations. So this is the first pair. Now there, there's uh, something obvious, fairly obvious missing um, from each of these people. So, so he's missing a foot and he's missing a hand. Um, but an, uh, what we'll see in the next few is basically they're, these are little studies in opposites. Um, you, he's facing right, he's facing left. Uh, he's in a, in a simple chair, he's in an elegant chair. He's dressed for outside, he's dressed for inside. Missing a foot, missing a hand. And uh, in this one, similarly, uh, so we have the statue without a head on the left and a bust without a body on the, on the right. Um, a mustache, a full beard, um, the full glasses and the pince-nez, is, is that right? Um, and also, this is uh, going back to that uh, ballet poster, notice the position of the feet. <laughs> and uh, you'll, a lot of his illustrations, you'll see um, that his characters are standing in one of the ballet positions. It, it was sort of a, a, refl or a, 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 well, a reflex, almost. Um, and then this last one is a little, even more fun. So, the pair on the left are facing each other, the pair on the right are facing away. The pair on the left, no canes, the pair on the right have canes. Um, but this is the fun part when I noticed it. Um, these two don't have any eyes. This eye is closed, this eye is a patch. These two don't have any ears. <laughs> um, and sort of an ongoing thing, a lot of what Ted did looked like there might be some deeper meaning. Um, and he, and people are always looking for deeper meanings, and he kind of played with that. Um, but there usually isn't actually a deeper meaning. <laughs> and so I, this, was, this was for fun, and it was, these were never published, so this is kind of a treat to be able to see them at all. Um, and he just gave them to his aunt. Um, yeah, and now I've got them. And uh, so that's goodbye, Mr. Earbrass. Oops. So when I was growing up, we all shared the same uh, summer home uh, in Barnstable um, from when I was born in 1967 until he moved to what's now the Edward Gorey House Museum uh, in 1986. And he lived there for the last 14 years of his life. Um, but as a family, when we were all doing things together, um, there's a lot of exploring beaches and lakes and ponds and picnic at, picnicking at them. Um, this picture here from, whoops, yikes, sorry, I meant to p press the laser. Uh, this is uh, the graveyard, this is the Cobb Hill Cemetery uh, at the Unitarian Church. And that's Edward and my grandmother, Betty Garvey. And, uh, and the illustration on the right is from his, one of his books, The Willowdale Handcar. Um, and I just liked putting an actual photo that my Aunt Eleanor took next to an illust illustration of a couple more or less doing the same thing. In fact, some of my uh, relatives are buried uh, in that cemetery, although that's not what they're looking at. Um, uh, there, we also, we went to yard sales. We went yard sailing almost every Saturday morning for years um, and would often compete for the same piece of rusty metal or odd-shaped object. 
Um, in fact, he might have been happier when I wasn't there. Um, but he also worked here, um, and uh, his, he lived in the, his room in the family house in Barnstable was the, was the attic, and there's a tiny insulated room up there that also doubled as his workspace. Um, and uh, he, he would let me watch if I, you know, I, he, I actually got to watch him draw some. Um, and uh, occasionally, I, there was one time where he came storming down from upstairs really angry at one of his cats who just knocked the uh, ink over on a drawing that he'd just about completed. Um, and that may have happened more than once, but he loved his cats dearly. And uh, we, we, so I mentioned the jigsaw puzzles. We had a couple summers where uh, we would go to the toy store and come back with an armload of board games that we'd play once or twice and then never play again. Um, and I'll say more about cooking in a moment. Uh, these next are just a few pictures of Ted around the Cape. Again, all taken by my Aunt Eleanor. Um, I think that's, that's Spotfish Park, or also known as Sandy Neck Beach in 1961. Uh, showing that he's not afraid to get his feet in, into the mud. Um, that's, I think that's also around uh, at Gray's Beach. Uh, a picnic that I think is in Brewster somewhere. Um, and another illustration from the Willowdale handcar of a family having a picnic. Um, there's even a similar uh, oh, hitting the wrong button. A similar basket here and here. Um, so he did draw things from life. Um, sometimes, and you might have to stretch it a little bit. But um, so that's Ted in our kitchen uh, cooking dinner for the family. Um, and so, first off, he's cooking for the family, which is. Some, I mean, he, he enjoyed cooking. We once had a meal where he made everything blue. Um, th I, that was before my time, and apparently it was blue, but not all that good. Um, and uh, this may fall kind of flat, but I think of that, I think of that as Ted in his Jerry Garcia phase. Um, but that's uh, Ted lounging, lounging in the backyard in 1984. Um, in another version of his, his relaxed summer getup. And uh, that's Ted and my mother on the side of uh, Maraspin Marsh in Barnstable Village. Um, I, this is, I, I like the photo a lot. Um, they, the family, this, this is before I was born, but the, the family spent a lot of time walking on, around beaches and march, marshes. Uh, collecting whatever might be found in the, in the, um, in the marsh hay. Um, and this leads us to, I know it's a question that a lot of people are wondering about, which is this whole deranged cousins thing. And the deranged cousins. <laughs> so this was a, a, a short book of his um, that was dedicated to my Aunt Eleanor and my mother's ski, um, a souvenir of a, of a a Labor Day wandering around, actually collecting things on the sides of, of some marshes. Um, the, uh, the one on the top right just introduces the names of the three, three cousins, Rose, Marsh, Mary, Mary Rose Marsh, and Marsh Mary Rose. <laughs> um, they lived in a house covered with roses on the edge of a marsh. Um, and the, that, that Another thing about this particular book, besides that it's dedicated to my mother and my aunt, is that it's the most Cape Cod of all of his books. Um, so that's the, the, that could be a corner of the house I live in now in Barnstable, um, with, the, you know, with the cedar shingles and that, those windows. Um, and then uh, for any of you who lived through last winter's flooding, um, the text on the bottom right says, the, the next winter she was carried off by an unusually high tide. Uh, it may come as no surprise, but all three cousins are dead by the end of the book. <laughs> um, the entire book is, is in one of the amphigories, um, so it can be browsed to afterwards if, if you like. Um, so he used to, used to spend winters in New York and summers here, um, but when he, uh, he started visiting 
uh, Barnes, well, the Cape, uh, when he went to college and uh, learned that he had cousins who lived on the Cape, and then started coming down uh, occasionally and then for longer periods of time, and then eventually uh, moved here year round in 1986 um, to the house at 8 Strawberry Lane. Um, that's the house uh, when he bought it. Um, there's, the hardest thing about this presentation was narrowing it down. Um, and there's a lot about the Edward Gorey House that's probably best handled by just visiting the Edward Gorey House. Um, I mentioned Parnassus Book Service because uh, he was a, a very good customer of, of, uh, of, of Ben Muse, the, the founder of the, of the service. Um, he had standing orders for types of books and suddenly boxes of books would show up. Um, and he'd look at them quickly and maybe not even take them out of the box and they just kind of piled up. That there's sort of an ongoing question as whether to whether he was a collector or a hoarder, um, and it's a it's a fine line. Um, he was also uh, he went to the original Jack's Outback uh, for breakfast and lunch pretty much every single day, um, and uh, one of the things about Jack's, uh, the original Jack's, is that you actually wrote out your own meal ticket. You, go, you would decide what you wanted and then you'd write it on a slip and some of it was even self-serve. You'd go get your own chowder and then uh, it was sort of the honor system for paying. Um, but there's, there's a little po uh, a display at the Edward Gorey House of, uh, it's a month of Edward Gorey's uh, at, at Jack's Outback and it shows all the little meal slips in his own handwriting. You can see what he ate for breakfast and lunch every day. Um, and in addition to keeping up with uh, illustrating, writing and illustrating his own books, he got involved in all sorts of theatrical productions around the Cape, um, from creating posters. Um, I picked that one because if you notice, it, it, that was a production at the Barnstable Com uh, Comedy Club. Um, but he did, he, he did posters, but he also uh, directed uh, plays based on his own work. Um, and if one of the actors, uh, for some reason, wasn't there, he would often act in his own plays. Um, a lot of his plays uh, included puppets that he designed and was often the puppeteer of, or one of the puppeteers. Um, and these productions were in Provincetown, Woods Hole, Ketuit, uh, at the Dennis Playhouse, uh, the Comedy Club, although that's not his own product, well, what, he did the poster. Anyway, uh, he, he was deep into the Cape Cod theater scene, and uh, some of his most <coughs> avid fans and friends uh, late in his life were the people he worked with in local theater. I don't know if anybody's here who ever acted, but... Uh. Um, and uh, moving right along, we're already at the last slide. Um, but there's a lot more that could be talked about. So he died in 2000 of a heart attack. Um, he, he, he had diabetes, he had uh, uh, cancer that was being treated. <coughs> He was, wasn't in the great, greatest of health, but it was a heart attack that got him. Um, now, all my life, uh, you know, people, people would find out that he was my cousin and ask uh, you know, if he would uh, autograph a book and, and, and so on. And, and so I knew he was, had fans, and, but I really didn't appreciate what a big deal he was until he died and the obituaries started popping up. Um, he had not one but two obituaries in the New York Times, a, a quickie sort of the day after and then a much more in-depth multi-page one a few days later. Um, it was front, front of the uh, Boston Globe entertainment section. Um, it was front page news in the London Times and the LA Times. Um, so he, he's a pretty big deal and has fans all over the world. Um, in fact, a, 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 a a display of his art was uh, in Japan uh, not too long ago. Um, so, in short, I learned what a big deal he was after he died. Though there was one day where we were making fun of him about something while having dinner, and uh, he, sort, he sort of said, you know, I'm famous. <laughs> as, as if that would stop the teasing, which of course it didn't. Um, so one question when he died was, what happens to his estate, um, not just the cotton, all his stuff, but the art um, and the royalties and all that. And, uh, but it, much to our surprise, he had a very thorough and well put together will. And he ended up leaving the estate and all the proceeds from his art 
um, to various animal charities. Um, and he specified three specifically, the uh, Zertzi Society for the Protection of Invertebrates, uh, Bat Conservation International, <laughs> um, and, the, and, uh, and the Animal Rescue League. Um, so my thought on the Zertzi Society is that he was a real big fan of bats, so he wanted to protect the bats' food supply. Um, and so you know, that uh, photo of him, he's wearing one of his famous fur coats. Um, he had, it was a, a, he had a 15 or 16 of them, and, uh, but he had kind of a, an awakening in the 80s about wearing the animal fur and, uh, and put them away and never wore them again. Um, and in his house, uh, there's a small third floor, and it was, the house was in pretty bad shape, and a raccoon family moved in one summer. And uh, he saw them there, and he just closed the door and let them go about their business. <laughs> so, in, in short, he went from wearing fur coats to housing uh, furry wild animals. Um, so, the, the, probably the best thing that, that's happened after his death was that his house uh, uh, became a museum. Um, a, a charitable foundation based in Boston that uh, associated with the Tufts Veterinary Clinic uh, found out about all of this and, uh, and bought the house. And, uh, and now it's a museum. It's a great museum. And I, I highly recommend anybody who's even the slightest bit interested uh, that they go. Um, it's great even for little children. There's a, there's a Gashley Crumb Tiny scavenger hunt arranged around the house, so you can go find a representation of each of the 26 deaths. <laughs> um, and you can keep a little checklist, too. So you can, like, you can send the young ones off to do that. Um, it's got examples of his art. It's got examples of one of his fur coats, um, his jewelry. And, uh, and it's got one of the best museum gift shops uh, that I'm, I know of. Um, it, and it's got... You know, jewelry and ties, and all, most of his books, and all kind, of, and it's it, it's a great place to go Christmas shopping. Um, the documentary, I I don't know if it's ever going to see the light of day. Um, a local documentarian named Chris Seifert uh, followed Ted around for a half a year or so, um, leading into his death, and got some footage, but not really enough. And he's working with some other artists to try to animate some of Ted's books to see if they can you know, make it into a, a real documentary. Um, but it's been a hard slog, and I don't know if it'll ever see the light of day. Um, but the most exciting new thing is the forthcoming biography, um, which is going to be published in the beginning of November. Um, that's the cover of the book. Um, we've, I, the family, we've all cooperated a lot with the author. Um, I, he's a, the author is an interesting guy, and I think I, I'm optimistic that it'll be a very interesting and good book. Um, and that, that's that. Um, I'm open for questions. <laughs>